What's up? What's up? This is Zach Boschman checking in. You are locked into the Citizen Truth podcast. We're honored today to be joined by Robbie Martin of the legendary Martin family. They've done a lot in this independent media space. Robbie, uh, I want to talk about one of your documentaries, uh, American Anthrax. A lot of my audience was young during 9-11, 2001, um, and we just hit that 20-year anniversary. Um, It's my understanding we're about to hit another 20-year anniversary, I think maybe tomorrow. Uh, Today's the 17th, um, and that's the anniversary of the anthrax attacks. So what were the anthrax attacks? And if you can, just could you set the scene about Maybe what was the general political environment like at the time of these attacks? Sure. Um, I'll, I'm going to get to that question and say, I just wanted to clarify something for your audience. So the understanding that I think it was around the, and I'm, I'm not exactly sure of the date, but I think it was around the 17th or the 18th in which the four letters that were found by the FBI were postmarked. Now, uh, I've seen a lot of people saying that tomorrow or uh, this around the 17th or the 18th is the anniversary, 20th anniversary, but that's under the assumption that the letters were the only delivery method in terms of being the only murder weapon. So I, I guess I'll, I'll leave that as an aside for now to comment on later. Um, I, I usually see more the 5th of the October as the 20th anniversary because that's the first known uh, death, which was mm-hmm. Robert Stevens. But just taking people back really quickly to the beginning of what this was. So basically right after 9-11, there was all this hype and fear mongering about this idea of a second attack. And most people seem to be gravitating towards this idea. And when I say most people, I mean like these weird public policy wonks, these security officials were gravitating towards this idea of a biological attack was next. Some of them even didn't just say biological weapons as a catch-all. They actually said anthrax is coming. Like there was, there was at least a couple, I want to say maybe two or three that for sure on record seemed to believe that the next attack was anthrax with extreme certainty, surprising level of certainty. So basically an anthrax attack did happen. Um, Five people, five Americans ended up dying from anthrax infection. Uh, the, The FBI says that they were all killed by letters uh, and the letters themselves, actually the letters uh, as they were addressed, so the letters that they found were addressed to four different people, two politicians, Tom Daschle and Patrick Leahy, who are known you know, in history as being rather centrist, milquetoast Democrats, right? They're not really seen as being these renegades. But apparently at the time, all they were doing was just trying to delay and slow down the, the fast tracking of the Patriot Act. They were the majority leaders in the Senate. They were just simply trying to be like, wait a second, let's have more discussion about this. This is like being pushed way too fast. And so there's a lot of people who've studied these attacks who think that they were politically motivated in the sense that whoever sent them these letters did, that, did it as retaliation for them merely delaying the passing of the Patriot Act. Now that's strange considering that there wasn't really anything in the news. Let's, okay, so just so your audience understands the full picture, the FBI eventually pinned these attacks on, you know, a a classic lone nut, Um, an inside U.S. government bioweapon scientist, essentially. So it was technically an inside job, according to the FBI, but he was a lone rogue nut named Bruce Ivins, who was so moved by 9-11, they claim that he was what you would call a super patriot. They have actually labeled him as a super patriot in their official investigation. So in essence, the FBI's official story is that someone was so inspired by the 9-11 attacks and Bush and Cheney's fear mongering that they decided to take it up upon themselves to send a follow-up attack, which was anthrax, through the mail to scare people into thinking that basically into thinking that the 9-11 terrorists were striking again, because I should also mention that these letters that were sent also had written, you know, it wasn't just an envelope filled with white powder. They actually came with letters and these letters said things, different things, but they, the, the theme of what the letter said was death to America, death to Israel, uh, 
Allah is great, which is kind of comical in and of itself because Muslims never say Allah is great. They either say Allahu Akbar or God is great. So it's already kind of like a bizarre mistake to make for, you know, a sophisticated murder to this of this level. The letters were addressed 9-11-01, like they were, it was written 9-11-01, death to America, death to Israel. Um, some of the letters said, take penicillin now, which maybe implied that whoever sent them didn't want people to die, maybe on in some of the letters. But basically my point is who the letters were addressed to, Dashiell, Patrick Leahy, Tom Brokaw, I believe of, uh, I want to see NBC News, and the New York Post. There were four letters addressed to two politicians and two media outlets. Now, the media outlets seem random because there was really no political motive necessarily for doing that, unless the goal was to create a climate of fear among journalists that we are targeting you now. 9-11 didn't target any journalists. They didn't fly a building into like the, you know, Rockefeller Plaza or whatever. They flew building World Trade Center. So this explicitly was designed to scare journalists. I mean, you know, half of the tar known targets were journalists. Now, what's strange is the people who ended up dying were never sent letters. Um, the FBI's sort of official story about that is that they were mostly collateral damage from cross-contamination from the letters. Now, this is something that I keep going back to years after studying this, you know, a, a lot, um, is that so, so go, going back to the very big first thing you said about tomorrow being the anniversary, I believe that it's you can make a very good case for the fact that the FBI trying to say that the delivery method was letters only and that everybody who died was merely uh, cross-contamination or collateral damage. I, I believe that that theory can largely be ignored because we already know how much of a cover-up and how much of a neat little bow they wanted to wrap this whole investigation up into. They first blamed somebody that they ended up totally dropping as their suspect. And then he sued them and won a $6 million lawsuit. His name is Stephen Hatfield. So I'm proposing a new theory, which is that I think we need to start looking at the anthrax attacks from the perspective of there was more than one person involved. Um, if Bruce Ivins was involved at all, which I personally don't think that he was. Um, and that we also need to start looking at this from the perspective of were there other delivery methods used? was there some other delivery method of anthrax used? Because I think to sort of lump this all together with the mail sorters and the envelopes, I think would be basically glossing over a lot of just the strange logistics of how people as far away as Connecticut ended up dying from anthrax. And, you know, the two of the postal workers getting anthrax, you can maybe deduce that too. Yeah, maybe that was a mail sorter. They were handling mail, right? But Robert Stevens, the first anthrax victim on October 5th, a letter was never found. And what's very odd is they decided he had died from inhalation anthrax, which is inhaling spores. Usually you can't inhale spores of anthrax unless it's weaponized or it's made, you know, it's sort of like lab grade anthrax. What, what's so strange is the Bush administration first said for, I think, a half a week that, oh, he, he might have drinking some water from a stream and, and gotten anthrax from a natural source. Well, I mean, you would think any doctor at the time who had examined him and his body or autopsy or whatever would have been able to see the difference between inhalation or cutaneous or ingested anthrax. But I'm not a scientist, so maybe not. But, but I guess my point is overall, and I'll, let, I'll return back to you for your next question, is that I think that the idea that these that the anthrax came from the letters um, may only be one piece of the puzzle and that there may have been other delivery methods used to get people like Robert Stevens infected with anthrax. So uh, the the blame wasn't pinned on Stephen Hatfield or Bruce Ivins in the beginning, right? There was like something to do with bentonite and they were trying to blame it on Iraq. Could you go into that a little bit? Yeah, so you have all these sort of different layers of different narratives. So you have... At first, what's interesting is you have the media actually independently on their own pushing for this idea that, well, isn't this terrorism? Isn't this guy who just got anthrax, didn't he just get attacked in some kind of terrorist attack? Strangely, the Bush administration for at least a week, maybe a half a week, was saying, no, 
we think this guy just died. Co total coincidence. Can you imagine the Bush administration out of everything that they hyped up and used, you know, to take advantage of? Suddenly, an anthrax attack lands in their lap, and they're just sitting there going, "No, we don't think this is terrorism." I mean, that in of itself is very, very peculiar, and I think we need to examine that further. Um, so, what happened was the media kind of started asking those questions. Now, eventually, the Bush administration did come out and say, "This is terror. Um, it's not. He didn't get it from a stream." Um, but the FBI. Because the CDC was originally on the investigation. Strangely, the FBI and no actual like law enforcement group was assigned to Robert Stevens' case for at least a week. Now, that's odd. Why would the Bush administration, you would think one of the neocons in there would be like, okay, yeah, we're going to just behind the scenes send out a team to investigate this, even if they wanted to hide or, you know, for some reason not scare the public at that point. Why would they only let the CDC in there? That's a, that's a very strange thing. Um, with all the hype, as I was saying after 9-11, that the next attack is going to be anthrax. So many people were saying this. So for them to not look at that, even as terrorism at the beginning is odd. But then the FBI, when they got involved, of course, they immediately decided it was terrorism and that somebody had gotten Robert Stevens killed with anthrax. It was, it was, a, it was a murder. But right away, actually, as early as November 2001, there was FBI leaks coming out into the media saying that we we know this is AIM strain. So if this is a, a terrorist biological attack, it's it's AIM strain. It's someone who has access to basically the U.S. government's strain of anthrax. AIM strain was designed by the U.S. military, I want to say sometime in the 1950s, maybe the 70s. I don't know the exact date. But it was it has hallmark signs of U.S. fingerprints, essentially not saying we know which scientist sent this, but we know that it was it's the AIM strain. It came from a, it's a U.S. military type of anthrax. That story kind of was in the background. Most people, I would say, in the United States didn't pay attention to that at all. In fact, they were still being scared by the fact that there were still people dying of anthrax and the Bush administration was sort of, you know, alluding to this three-way connection between Saddam, 9-11, bin Laden at the time. Bush never came out there and said Saddam did the anthrax. Um, no one in the Bush administration ever said Iraq did the anthrax. But people that they were extremely close with in the outside of the administration, neocons specifically, were going around everywhere saying that Saddam did the anthrax. That's what they were saying. So it was almost like the Bush administration had people that they were that were loyalists to them on the outside making these connections for them now i think this is the cleverness of the bush administration that's been largely overshadowed by this idea that they lied about wmds which they did but they didn't care that they lied about them because they knew from the very beginning by saying saddam might have wmds or saying that we need to worry about wmds as the next attack they knew that people they, they meant anthrax what i'm saying is they were using it as code for anthrax and so they never had to actually come out and say that we think Saddam did anthrax. It was almost like all the seeds were already planted that, you know, people were already saying Saddam was involved in 9-11 and that anthrax was the next attack and that Clinton for all throughout the 90s was talking about how Saddam had anthrax and was going to send a Scud missile tipped with anthrax to the U.S. So people already had this in their heads. But people were scared of yeah, anthrax. Yeah, people were already yeah. scared and thought it was possible that Saddam was going to attack us. So what the Bush administration did is they just used this fear. They never came out and said, this is AIM strain. It's an inside, you know, we know it's some kind of insider. We're looking at scientists, even though that's what the FBI started to do already at that point. So by the time Colin Powell is up there at the UN, actually giving his final pitch for the Iraq war, which was the Bush administration's like final sales pitch, um, it, it was all about anthrax. Because they knew that the public wasn't paying attention to these little leaks here and there where FBI insiders were like, hey, this is aim strain. Like, check this out. They knew that people were still just terrified and scared. And, and basically what they did, and Colin Powell, again, he never at that pitch says, Saddam, we think Saddam sent this envelope full of anthrax. He never says anything like that. Instead, he just keeps bringing up the envelope with the, the envelopes of the anthrax, and he he talks about how much was in the letters, and how Saddam has so much more anthrax 
that he could basically kill like tens of thousands with anthrax and letters if he wanted to. So that's, I think, sh reveals the cleverness. And I don't know, you know, if the, the White House counsel told him to talk about it this way. I think it was more clever than that. I think it was some spook shit where they were they knew that by creating all these vague illusions, but not specifically trying to make these connections too specifically, that it would basically just work out in their favor and they could link, you know, they could just keep amping up the fear and get this to go over the top. And essentially what the Bush administration did is they used the fear of the anthrax attacks to get us into the Iraq war. So I just, as a retort to a lot of like 9-11 truth debunkers who say, well, yeah, I mean, the Bush administration just got really, really lucky and they took advantage of this 9-11 attacks as much as they could. Well, I'll, I have bad news for those people. They got really, really lucky twice in a row. Like really, really, really lucky. I mean, the, the statistical likelihood of them getting two attacks in a row that were like exactly what they wanted is, I mean, it's, it's virtually impossible. So, you know, that's what I would like to say to those people is those are, that's two in a row, you know, two for two. <laughs> super lucky exactly what they wanted gave them you know the opportunity for exactly what they wanted to do so by the time they they uh tried to pin the anthrax on on Stephen Hatfield do they pin on him first and then Bruce Ivins when like uh cuz he he like sued the government right Stephen Hatfield could you just go a little bit more into those stories yeah so at first, actually, the FBI consulted with Bruce Ivins. I say consulted with. They were looking for inside government scientists who were experts in anthrax to help them with the case. So actually, their eventual final suspect, Bruce Ivins, was a consultant on the, SV and on the FBI investigation for several years. He's actually written about in media reports as being present with FBI personnel as they were, um, I believe, uh, draining this pond outside of Fort Detrick, Maryland, where the FBI believed someone could have disposed as of evidence in. Bruce Ivins was standing around, you know, in basically uh, with them as they're draining this pond. So this is years and years before Bruce Ivins becomes the eventual suspect that the FBI narrows in on. But before that happens, in between both of those times, they start narrowing in on a retired uh, Fort Detrick maryland um scientist named stephen hatfield and they start narrowing in on him actually for i think for very valid reasons he wrote a very interesting very prescient book um talking about how like a, i think it even mentions how a government scientist could go rogue and do like a terrorist attack with some kind of biological weapon and it's not anthrax i don't think in his book but it's something like it and it had eerie similarities to the attacks that had already happened so I think that's part of why they started looking at him. I think other people kind of told the FBI, hey, they dropped hints like, hey, you maybe should start looking at this guy. I know there was a bioweapons uh, government official, ex-government official named Francis Boyle, who actually tried to reach out to the FBI himself, who helped write the bioweapons treaty and say, hey, you know, this has to be, there's only like a small amount of individuals in the United States who have, would have access and the ability to do this. Here's who you should look at. Now, what's interesting is that FBI agent he talked to, name is Spike Bowman. He's, that FBI agent's also responsible for blocking the warrant to search Zacharias Mosawi's laptop. That a lot of experts, even the most generic journalists in the world, will say if that laptop was searched, 9-11 might not have ever happened. They might have been able to stop the 9-11 attacks so here's Spike Bowman, this FBI agent. Apparently, the day after, a couple of days after Francis Boyle tells him this and gives him a list of names, the aim strain samples, the database of them is destroyed at the University of Illinois that the FBI basically has possession over. Now, Francis Boyle's first thought is, why would someone have destroyed this database when I literally told the FBI yesterday or a couple of days before to this is the database in which you need to identify the culprit from. So this this weird coincidence that Spike Bowman, this FBI agent thwarted, you know, could have been responsible for getting rid of the database of aim strain samples to identify who might have done this and could have blocked a warrant for one of the potential 9-11 hijackers. So that's a bizarre coincidence there. But What's Steve his name, Spike? Oh, sorry, go ahead. What was his name? Spike Bowman? 
Yeah, his nickname is Spike, but that's what he's known uh, uh, as in within the agency. Um, so Stephen Hadfield eventually became very publicly targeted, which is unusual. He became a person of interest. John Ashcroft of the Bush administration, the attorney general, started to come out and say, we believe we have a person of interest in the anthrax attacks. Now, you would think this is weird. How are they selling the Iraq war while they're you know, saying they have a person of interest and it's a bioweapon scientist? That is weird. But they were still able to develop this murky connection to Iraq you know, while they were doing this, um, pointing at Stephen Hadfield. Now, Stephen Hadfield starts to fight back against this sort of public blowing up of his identity. And he goes and does a press conference and very adamantly says, I am not the anthrax killer. I had nothing to do with this. You know, this is extremely uh, inappropriate use of like legal means. This is harassment. And the FBI actually was doing things like what they call bumper lock surveillance, which is in your face harassment. FBI agents would be laughing at him as he walked out of his door. They'd be waving at him to let them, you know, let him know that they were there watching him. They'd be searching through his trash and call the local media to come, you know, watch them searching through his trash, all types of things like that. Um, and he believes, he's even said in an interview that he believes they were trying to crack him. And he actually became suicidal at one point. He admits, he, I think he breaks down into tears during an interview and he admits that it was got so bad, the pressure got so bad that not that he was thinking of confessing to a crime he didn't do, but that he was he was suicidal. When now, was this, like, uh, just get you real quick, What where, where are we, like, timeline-wise as far as uh, when Stephen Hatfield becomes the person of interest? That's a good question. I want to say it's late 2003, early 2004. But I'm not exactly sure. But that would that I think that timing makes sense because the Iraq War was already we already got in, so it wasn't like you know it was having Stephen Hatfield as the suspect wasn't too risky uh, to have the Bush administration being you know talking about him. But that's I think around the time that it was, and eventually uh, they completely uh, dropped it, like him as the suspect. It became a scandal in the news, actually, which thankfully a few reporters, you know, came in and seemed to, you know, counter that narrative. Actually, a, a reporter named Nicholas Kristoff was actually seemingly getting leaks from the other direction leading up to Stephen Hatfield's harassment, where he was reporting things like saying, Mr. X, like there's this suspect named Mr. X that the FBI is like sure did the attacks, but there's a reason why they can't get him. And these are the reasons he wrote writing all these pieces claiming this guy named Mr. Mr. X was for sure the Andex killer. And Stephen Hadfield ended up suing him also in his lawsuit, which he got six million dollars from. And uh, what was interesting was all the reporters basically pleaded the fifth. They were all subpoenaed and they refused to acknowledge or admit uh, who gave them the information. They didn't give up their sources which tells me that the federal government, you know, basically said, Hey, we're just going to take the hit on this. Don't give up. Don't tell, don't tell them that we, you know, who in our agency told you these things. Uh, we're just going to, you know, we're just going to pay them off in a settlement. And that's basically what happened. So they could have fought it and, you know, revealed some things, but the fact that they basically stonewalled, I think says a lot. They didn't want to know who was leaking out his name. Now, eventually the FBI years after that, they start to narrow in on Bruce Ivins, their original consultant on the FBI on the FBI investigation. And they basically start, I mean, seemingly pushing him into suicide because what happens eventually is he does commit suicide before the FBI actually files charges against him. In fact, I think two days after they try to force a written confession from him, he then ends up allegedly committing suicide. Now, the unfortunate thing is, it doesn't seem like any of his family is willing to speak to the press. Um, they haven't spoken to the press as far as I know. Uh, Stephen Hadfield got a huge settlement. He's probably not going to really talk about it anymore. Uh, the first victim's wife got a pretty big settlement as well. Uh, the amount of people you can actually talk to who are close to this are, you know, not as, uh, they're not that many anymore. But I guess one of the most, 
you know, effed up parts about all this is that, you know, the FBI clearly wasn't confident in the fact that this was that their their suspect was Bruce Ivins. I mean, you could you could see it on their faces. The, I'm not a body language expert, but watch the press conference of the FBI announcing who they believe you know the, the suspect is and the case is closed. They're sweating. They're they're nervous. They're fidgeting. They don't want to be there. And yeah, you guess, have that scene in the documentary, right? Yeah. yeah. And guess who wasn't there? Who was in charge of the investigation? Robert Mueller. Apparently, what? Robert Mueller was so basically nervous to appear in public that he basically uh, ducked out of the press conference and hid out at a restaurant across the street um, in, in downtown D.C. He was just sort of lying low, waiting for the fallout, you know, from the press conference. And there was some fallout, actually, because even just on a surface level of like, you know, basic journalistic instincts, you could see these totally beltway generic ass DC reporters being like, wait a second, you knew he was a, a potential suspect, but then you let him continue to like work at the lab, like around bioweapons. Like, I don't understand how it was. They were so confused. You can like every single reporter asking them question was just like baffled. They didn't, they, they were just, but you, you know, that didn't carry over into like continued digging by reporters. It just sort of fizzled out. And after that, I say the most interesting thing that I cannot explain really at all is that the anthrax attacks themselves, like you mentioned at the beginning of this, have been forgotten. They've been memory hold. And it's so weird because it was the second attack. It's it's 9-11 than anthrax. It's not it's it's you know, I know a lot more people were killed on 9-11. I understand why it takes up so much more space. But I truly believe that if the Bush administration didn't get both they wouldn't have been able to do nearly the amount of crap that they were able to get away with. I mean, the Patriot Act, um, you know, anthrax basically was like the fuel. It, it was created in the hysteria of anthrax. That's how the Patriot Act came to be. And, um, you know, even Iraq, like, would they really have been able to slide us into Iraq as easily if Colin Powell didn't, you know, his entire presentation was about anthrax. Nobody, people would have been like, why are they talking about anthrax? Like, this is not, this is, it seems hysterical, you know? And then an, really, a real anthrax attacks happen. All of a sudden, it seems plausible to people. They're afraid. People didn't want to go check their mailbox. I mean, that was a real thing that was happening at the time. Yeah, I remember my mom like wanting to go to the store to buy duct tape and plastic, like painter's plastic or something. Yeah. I feel like they were telling people to do that at the time. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny. I actually, it's, it, I remember that being around the same time as anthrax, but what's even more disturbing about that is that was additional fear mongering they put out at the launch of the Iraq war, implying to people that Saddam was going to retaliate by launching sarin like into uh, our, that's probably what it was. Yeah. So, like they had anthrax. Okay. So basically for people don't remember, 9-11, anthrax a month later, then Richard Ramirez shoe bomber in the in the airplane, you know, supposedly a guy who collaborated with the hijackers. That's how we got all the airline securities, you know, the shoes off, all that shit was not as a direct response to 9-11. It, it kept like accumulating from all these different events. And then we had the DC sniper, like a guy like picking off totally random people with a sniper rifle in DC. I mean, and he had, turns out to be a Muslim guy. I mean, what are the chances of that happening? And, and you know, as you said, then they're after all that, then they're now saying, now put duct tape up on your windows as we go into Iraq because now Saddam might send another terrorist attack over here. So it's just like the fear just kept going and going for different reasons, you know? And I really do think it was the anthrax. It's almost like the anthrax was the catalyst chemical to really make this all flare up the way it did. I, I don't, I mean, I, again, I'll say 9-11, as spectacular as it was, I don't think it would have had the lasting impact if it didn't feel like one out of a series of attacks. And uh, you say at the end of the documentary, um, Obama had like an executive order, right, in regard to investigating the, the anthrax attacks? Yeah, um, I think I actually made, that's a slight... I, I made a mistake. I actually, I think on that line in the, in the text caption, it wasn't an executive order exactly, but he threatened behind the scenes to, to veto, to executively veto 
any more funding allocated to a reopening of the investigation. Um, that's so it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's that's what he did. And that was reported on. So there is no like Obama executive order where he's just like, I will know he's not like writing on a piece of paper. I will no longer, you know, this is case closed. It's more like um, he just did it kind of quietly. And, you know, Russ Holt and some other um, congressmen are responding to that essential closure of any possibility of reopening this when they basically asked for a reopening of it. That was it was their and now their sort of attempt to do that in Congress was uh, a response to that news about Obama cl closing the investigation down. Uh, do you think there's any chance that an investigation could get reopened? Uh, officially, I don't think so. I, I think it almost will, will make it, the only way it, it will happen is that there's enough public pressure. Um, if there's like, you know, a Netflix miniseries about it or something that makes people think about all this stuff again, you know, um, otherwise, no, I don't think anything's going to happen. Uh, I, I think that it's up to basically citizen journalists uh, at this point, p independent journalists. I, don't, I think the journalistic class has decided this is either too big, too scary or too simply uninteresting to them to look at. Um, and I think either of those possibilities are pretty disturbing to me. I mean, if journalists are scared to look at this, I think that that says that that says a, a, a lot of really disturbing things about the state of our country and that we think we live in a democracy, uh, that it's not fascist. I mean, if journalists out there, you know, especially like DC ones or, or even politicians were scared to figure out who tried to murder them because they were worried it would go too high up. I mean, that's basically almost like it, it's a scarier version of how the Western press describes, you know, Putin's Russia, how they, his, you know, how they um, fear monger about what, what, what they say about Putin's Russia, that Putin is killing journalists, that he's poisoning dissidents. I mean, well, at least he's, I mean, like, if that's true, I don't, I'm not saying I subscribe to that, but he's at least doing it right on the open. In America, apparently, it's so low key under the radar that you just don't even talk about it. You know, it's like, oh, I just got to like put that out of my mind because it's like too scary. I don't want to think about I don't even want to think about if my country murdered 3000 of its own people and then killed five more with a bio weapon. I just don't want to think about it because I got to live. You know, I just got to enjoy my life, you know, um, so that I, I do think that that is what happens in America. And it's it's scary. It's scary to think that there's still an active bioterrorist murder or group of murder still out there that. You know, all the federal law enforcement agencies in the U.S. basically moved heaven and earth to avoid looking at. You know, I mean, that's that's pretty scary, I think. Uh, and that's what I believe happened. I think that there are definitely multiple people involved in this. Um, like I said at the beginning, I don't think the letters were the any were the only delivery method. Um, I think that the fact that three different media buildings in New York City, ABC News, NBC News and CBS News, which are actually all at three different addresses. They all, the Anthrax has found a Dan Rather's office in a different building than NBC News, where the only, you know, the only letter in that area was sent to. That's just weird. How did Anthrax get on Dan Rather's, get in Dan Rather's actual office from a letter being mailed to a different media building? I mean, explain that. I can't. And I don't know how the FBI was able to explain it by just saying this is all mail sorters, you know, because it definitely it magically scared the shit out of all the journalism, you know, journalists in DC and uh, New York specifically, because all of a sudden the anthrax is appearing in all their buildings at once. Robbie, thank you so much for, for talking with us today. We'll put a link to uh, American anthrax on the site with this post. Uh, it's kind of if you just search on YouTube for it, it like doesn't come up. So it seems like something's going on with the al algorithm there. But um, thank you so much, man. I hope to talk to you again soon. Well, thank you so much. And thanks for having me on. Zach Boschman here, co-owner of CitizenTruth.org. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of the Citizen Truth Podcast. 
The intro and outro song is Enthusiast by Tours and is provided via the Creative Commons license. Please subscribe and check us out at citizentruth.org.